all of them already in a slightly different capacity. Um, but we're very pleased to welcome back to our impromptu stage uh, Narabun Tabchampon from Chulalongkorn University, uh, Kevin Hewison from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the University of Macau, uh, Uvarak, the founder and president of Future Forum, and Miat Tet, it's, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Enlightened Myanmar Research Foundation. Future Forum, right? Not yes, Future Forum. Future Forum. forum. <laughs> forum. <laughs> keep our futures forum. slightly separate and hopefully in a good direction. The only yeah. difference is that he has millions of dollars and I don't. All right, we'll see what we can do about that based on today, shall we? <laughs> Um, so I'm going to dive right in and sort of start with the juxtaposition that seems to sit at the heart of this panel, that we have this idea that illiberalism is something that gets in the way of civil society, not something that we can say there is such a thing as an illiberal civil society. So I wanted to begin by asking each of you to sort of reflect on why we expect civil society to be, civil society to be liberal and the ways in which we see it manifest <coughs> as illiberal. Um, Naraman, do you want to start? <laughs> I'm the one who... Oh, you got a map. Uh, another map. <laughs> yeah, I, it's easy for me. Okay. Uh, uh, it's not exactly pure map, but I mean, this is a problem with Thai civil society. I think in the 1990, people tend to, especially in Thailand, people tend to see Thai civil society as a fostering for democracy. And then in the 20th and 21st century, we wondering that how come they are so yellow and sometimes even blue, now more blue than yellow. And uh, what went wrong? I mean, basically what went wrong with Thai civil society, why they go for the establishment and, and even they even compromise with the democracy. And especially if we look at the two coup, 2006 and 2014 coup. And for me, I think to look at the spectrum of civil society, I think basically is their own, is the dilemma of them. Uh, if we look like, if we want to map Thai civil society, we might say that they are two groups who are going for the globalization or we call the, the pietensization, that talking about how to cope with the new issues such as the uh, Northeastern Network and also those who already debate about how the EEC will look like or more green economy and also those who go to the formal sector and informal sector. But they also have another group who may be coming from the Cold War period or still feeling under this kind of thing that going to we call the community, uh, the community culture school, that they're going for re pietensization And that's the problem because a certain of this group become the alignment or become the ally of the so-called yellow. And those who are, especially those who are talking about how to dealing with the issue. And I think those who, uh, and, and in that case, for instance, and, uh, those who are talking about sufficient economy, but I think the debate, the sufficiency economy is the discord. It's not the real thing. I mean, it's no one be linking with the market. You go with the market anyway, but your market is under the patronage, under the benevolence of the state or the family, uh, the elite family. So in that case, it's a big problem with Thai civil society. <coughs> and they make the mistake I think maybe we might have to admit that in the last 10 years, civil society in Thailand have to bear the problem. We also have to admit, they have to admit that they're also committing to make the Thai democracy cannot go forward. But whether they have enough soul searching and change is another thing. But what I'm going to try to say today is that under this kind of character, what in this election, what happened to them? One thing that we found out is that some group decide to, in the past, people tend to believe between state, business, civil society, like a triangle. And they tend to believe that as a civil society, you are not support to, to dealing with the political society or economic society, but in reality, it's blurred. 
civil society in Thailand also accept some funding from the business, and definitely civil society in Thailand receive funding from the state. I mean, several promotion, so and so is a lot. So in that case, it's no, no, the no bottom line or no demarcation line. And for them, I think this is their myth to understand to feel that they should not involve in political party or not, should not involve in political society. And I think it was the debate long time ago whether the red shirt should be called civil society and then the yellow shirt should call civil society or not. But if we look in them in reality, they already in that. The chain for this election, I think first, they already admit that they went wrong. I mean, in a certain thing in terms of their role. But whether they are still, I mean, they can still be the, the uh, foster for democracy is still no. I think this is a problem that they still go with the establishment. And if we look at the NGO and civil society, Kevin maybe add more. But what I see for that, they have a certain civil society group and NGO that go to the political party, such as work with the Future Forward for a certain group. But they also have another group that still go with the business, I mean the state. Uh, they are not exactly say that they are support Palang Pacharat, but they are the group that still working with maybe community organization, CODI, which is also the back behind for the uh, Palang Pacharat party. And some still stay with the real yellow. If you look at the list of the person, who go for the action, the PDRC party, that I still cannot remember the political party name, action for something Thailand. The PDRC party, you will see a certain name of the civil society member that run for the election. But I think this is also the problem is that if we talk about liberal or illiberal concept, Thai civil society, in my opinion, they are still have not yet go beyond I mean, the, the issue of the uh, illiberal in that case. <coughs> Some start to talking about the issue of liberty, but I think this is still debating <coughs> at the moment. Thank you, Kevin, Kevin what's your take on the... What, yeah. the what was services? your actual question? Uh, why so they should be... My prop is why, why, why do we do think we they, should, think be they should be liberal? Yeah. And okay. what are some examples that show us they aren't? Okay, well, if we go back to the 1990s, and let me get a little bit theoretical here. Um, well, I'll get theoretical in a moment, but if you go back to the early 1990s or the mid-1990s, throughout so uh, many parts of Southeast Asia, there was a real enthusiasm for non-governmental organisations or civil society organisations and for the expansion of civil society in the region. And at the time, there was a kind of an efflorescence of activism, campaigns against free trade agreements on gender issues, uh, poverty reduction, human rights, agitation for democracy, and a whole lot more. And the optimism of the decade was driven by a, some kind of feeling of confidence that democracy was also, with this efflorescence of civil society, that democracy was taking root in the region, uh, growing on a foundation of thriving capitalist societies. And in many of the theoretical works, there's a strong link between the development of civil society and a capitalist society and democratisation. Um, the resonances, of course, with 1960s modernisation theory were are fairly clear. The third wave of democratisation was said to be washing over the region, and that was emphasised by the triumphs of popular uprisings in the Philippines, South Korea, Thailand in 1992, and Indonesia. And indeed, as I said, a vibrant civil society was considered a measure of democratisation. But that conceptualisation, um, one which views the groups making up, uh, which looks at all these groups making up civil society as being democratic, liberal, etc., is kind of limiting. Civil society, after all, is, is, tends to be a reflection of the society in which they grow up. And civil society and its political space is open, therefore, to many groups. Uh, not just those considered democratic, uh, democratic or progressive. The space can also be occupied by state-sponsored groups, right-wing groups, anti-immigrant and anti-democracy act activists, and many others considered nasty, fascist or re and reactionary. 
that the groups occupy civil society's political space, uh, that these groups will sometimes be violent and will oppose other groups, should be no surprise when we consider that all the societies of Southeast Asia, in one way or another, are riven and driven by conflict over all manner of resources. And civil society tends to reflect society as a whole, as I've already said. Um, the travails of electoral democracy in Southeast Asia should alert us to the fact that increased national wealth does not necessarily result in a civil society that becomes the natural ballast of democratisation. Um, the split we had that was just mentioned between civil society, economic areas or business, and civil, uh, did I say civil society, and state, state, state and civil society, the three, the, tr the triumvirate, as Naraman said, is that's broken down. But in one sense it's always been broken down, but it breaks down in different ways at different times. And if we think of, for example, the relationship between state and business in the last 20 or 30 years and neoliberalisation, etc., there isn't that distinction anymore between what is business and what is state. Business is inside the state in many, many ways. Um, and now I think the other thing, your, your my, diagram is gone. My diagram. Your map okay. is gone. <laughs> okay. If you look up at that top corner in mm -hmm. some sense, I mean, there's a movement in that direction in civil society as well, which, is a, which I've called in some of the things I've been writing sort of a, the struggle for civil society. Business is moving into civil society. And it's moving into it not just in political ways, but in terms of the way you do things like development that NGOs used to do. So you end up with a managerialism, a privatisation. You end up with social entrepreneurship. You end up with philanthropy. And I think that's another kind of uh, challenge to civil society. It always used to be considered that civil society was struggling with the state, and often the state was oppressive. But now you've got this notion of business struggling for the soul of civil society as well, whether that's a, uh, a, a liberal civil society or an illiberal civil society. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Barak, do you want to reflect on some of that or talk to us about illiberal civil society? Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's a saying that, I've, um, that you, don't, you don't support dictatorship until you're a dictator. <laughs> um, so in, in the case of, I think, illiberal li uh, civil society, I think, I think the, the, the problem uh, as I think sometimes understood by, by the West, uh, particularly for a country like Cambodia. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and narrow down to, to Cambodia. And, and that is uh, to look at it as, as an idea or ideologies or, or, or positions or policies instead of actually a space. A space is just a space. There's nothing more than that. And, and the, the objective of all of us should be to preserve that space where vibrant different ideologies, different interests and different ideas could, could take roots, could be debated, could be, you know, could, could be discussed and, and, and organically through that chaotic and messy process, uh, different people can actually pro push different ideas for, for, the, for, for the broader society. I think, I think the, the discussion of a liberal society in, in a way I think we're running in d into dangers of discussions of democracy overall, and, and this is actually true in, in the case of Cambodia, um, because because we tend we tend to identify Democratic Party and Communist Communist Party, and in the case of Cambodia, the CPP, the Cambodian People Party, is sometimes referred to by the opposition and some people within the NGO world um, as the Cambodian Communist or the Communist Party of Cam uh, Cambodian Communist Party or some sort, right? It's this thinking that, that you, you, you're, you're not a democratic party even though you're com competing in the democratic process. And, and because, because you identify in, in the sense, but my, my belief is as long as, as democracy is a, is a process, it's not, it's not itself just, a, just an idea, I mean it's a, itself is an idea, but that's an idea based on this system, or, or more of the process, not on public policies, or not, or not how you solve different issues, whether related to minimum wage or or, or any issue. So the, the aim would be to preserve that process. As long as you preserve that process, then, then things would hopefully improve over time. And, and if you want to see the, how, how, um, how messy the process is, all you need to do is actually look at two countries right now, the, uh, the Philippines and the US. 
it's, it's chaotic. And in the case of, of the US, I don't think in, in that definitions of civil society, whether they're progressive or not progressive, or they're actually taking funding from governments or businesses, in the US you don't have any civil society at all. Because most of them are actually affiliated to political parties, uh, either the Democrat or the Republican. Uh, most of them affiliate with some business interests uh, or ideologies, uh, and, and most of them uh, affiliate somehow with, with government institutions. You know, you have the RAND corporations that's affiliated with the, with the Defense Department, for example. Uh, they consider themselves to, to be civil society, to be a think tank, to be an NGO. Um, so, so I think that's, that's the, 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 I think this one thing that we need to keep in mind. Well, second, um, I, I just like to, to discuss civil society for, um, in Cambodia a bit. And there's, there's three dates that I think, in, if you want to understand Cambodian uh, contemporary history, com political, contemporary political history, there's only three dates you need to pay attention to. One is actually April 17, 1975. Obviously, there's a lot of Cambodia, Cambodia scholars here. You know, this, you know this date, right? April 17, 1975 is the beginning of the Khmer Rouge which is actually restart everything or, or bring about everything down, uh, bring, uh, uh, bring about the end of, of pretty much everything, right? Uh, but also at, on that day, one, one of the things that people tend to ignore is also it, it ended it end the junta government that was actually supported by the US. And to the minds of the Cambodian leaderships today, that is actually still play a role in their interpretations of that day. And, and that's usually not taken into account in an understanding of modern politics. The second date is January 7, 1979. What's, what happened on that day? For most of the Western look into that day, the Western views of, the, of that date is that's the end of the Khmer Rouge, right? The end of the atrocities, uh, a restart in some way, right? From, G, from year zero. But it's also, is the beginning of Vietnamese occupations, a, 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 a communist expansion, Vietnam communist expansion. It's also a beginning of actually US support of resistant force along the border. And Cambodian politics over the past, uh, over the past 40 years until today is basically go with that dividing line. If you look at the, uh, that date as the day that saved Cambodia from the Khmer Rouge, you support the ruling party, the Cambodian People's Party, who's in power today. If you believe, you view that date, you interpret that date, that date as Vietnam's invasion and occupation, Vietnam as our historical enemy, a far bigger uh, neighbor to us, the, um, who has to take lands from us, for example, it play into that psychologies and that narratives and that interpretation. If, you, if you, you look at that day as a day of Vietnam invasions, then you support the opposition. And until today, that's Cambodian politics. It's just two camps. But also what's important is actually the third date, is um, October 23rd, 1991. What happened on that day? Pair of Peace Agreement. Pair of Peace Agreement bring about a UN intervention or peacekeeping mission, the first peacekeeping mission in, in the world um, to Cambodia. And then a UN sponsor election of 1992, a, a, a UN sponsor constitution, uh, adopted in 1993, and so on, and the whole history that come afterward. But so what's happening on that date is, is also, and this is often overlooked, and to the West, from that day on, from that date on, Cambodia is a Western project, is a UN project. Until today, most of the Western government and experts look at Cambodia as a project. And this is, this is becoming a, a huge problem on, on how we deal with civil society because when you look at uh, Cambodia as a project and then you start civil society in, 1990, in the 1990s with a lot of UN uh, money and uh, we have more UN agencies in, in, in uh, Phnom Penh than many other capitals and many other bigger capitals. We have a lot of international organizations and all types, right? And, and what, what, the, what these money as Cambodia was a project, supposed to be a poster child of a post-Cold War uh, era, um, then there was an obsession of, of trying to recreate Cambodia in, different, in their own image. But the problem is actually in their own image is based on their different countries with different systems. So the French will have a legal system that actually reflect the French system. Uh, a common uh, law system will come in and say you have to do these things. It's actually coming with different agendas. Everybody had their own kind of what they define should be an ideal 
society or ideal country in, in the way they see fit. And there's a, I, I keep on saying that I think we have too many good advisors. We, we get so many good stuff. And, and combined is a horrible, I mean, too many good ingredients to combine, you can't eat it. It's very, very complicated, it's a very uh, issue. Now, there's actually an underlying problem with, with this thinking now. Cambodia is a Western project, as a project. There's two problems. One, Cambodian people themselves start to believe we are a project. And this is why, uh, if you look at the opposition strategy, for example, we, they want a recreation of the Paris Peace Agreement, another rescue mission by the UN or by the West. And that's all their strategy, that's their main strategy. And civil society is thinking in the same way, that democracy has to be delivered by other people who treat us as a project. And because we treat ourselves as a project, and the whole population, and this thing has got passed on to Cambodian young people. I'm talking about people who's not involved in any of these dates, who's born after all of these things, and yet it carry on. It's a, it's a contagious disease in some sense. And unless we're breaking away both the Cambodian populations and the Western governments who, treat, who, who want to see an improvement of the space, the democratic process as well as civil society space, until we, we break away from that, got that trap, that mental trap, then, then I don't see a vibrant, growing, organically growing, uh, civil, strong civil society. In the 1990s, uh, all of these Western experts used Cambodian NGOs or civil society as basically as agents, subcontractors who's doing the, the groundwork cheaper. That's all it is. There's, so because of that, it gets stuck, and, and that needs to that, that needs to be that's, that needs to be there needs to be a break from from all of that. Okay, thank you. There's a lot I'm going to pick up on that's come out of the first three so far, but I want to ask Miat-Tet first to reflect on that initial, why do we expect civil society, be, civil society to be liberal and where do we see that it isn't? Yeah, actually, I first would like to reflect um, um, how uh, Myanmar uh, became uh, familiar with the terms of civil society, you know. So then I would like to point out 2008 uh, Cyclone Nargis. Yes, we have uh, civil societies in the past, uh, in the uh, independence, uh, you know, uh, causes for independence era, but uh, we, we were not known to that uh, institutions as uh, civil societies. We don't call them. But in 2008, uh, Cyclone Nargis, and then you, you all know that we have experienced this uh, over half a century of uh, uh, dictatorship and military uh, authoritarianism. So uh, in 2008, we have this uh, very disastrous, highly disastrous Cyclone Nargis which kills over 140,000 people in one night. And this is the most disastrous disaster in our um, recorded history. So after that cyclone, right after the cyclone, the military junta uh, uh, didn't uh, let the international communities to come in uh, to give the supports to the cyclone affected communities. And it is only the, the civil societies, it is only the people themselves uh, uh, make, making efforts to help the affected people. And then after uh, like two weeks with a harsh push of international communities, they let the international communities open, uh, I mean, come in to the country and then started the uh, response, emergency response. Since then, what I think is the, we have a give way for international communities to come in and to, uh, to be involved in the uh, democ uh, democratizations and more democratic transitions of the countries. And I think with those all impacts in 2010, yes, of course, the polit we also have to somewhat uh, appreciate the political will of the military junta to make a change, you know. Uh, I don't 
say democratization, but to uh, liberalize, to politically liberalize it in order to legitimize themselves, right? So in 2010, um, we have this uh, political liberalization. So starting from this 2008, uh, uh, after Cyclone Nargis, with the involvement and support of international communities, starting first more on the emergency aid, then recovery, and then to the development aid. What they brought about is um, the, the, the project called Good Governance. So, and now this concept of good governance, civil society plays a key role in uh, uh, implementing good governance projects um, and um, a, play a key role in democratization and maintaining de democracy as one of the pillars uh, of the uh, democracy. You know. So I think this is how Myanmar has been familiar with the term of the civil society. And with this good governance uh, concept and uh, values uh, dictated by the international community, mainly the Western yeah, communities, uh, um, we, I think, um, started uh, familiar with the ideas of liberal democracy and liber liberal values. Um, and then um, this is, and then this groups started uh, working on development projects with the assistance of the international communities. They are, they were mainstream these liberal ideas. And then in um, around like two thousand. Um, I would say 2016, um, the, the state councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, started actually uh, talking about uh, the involvement of civil society in the peace process, even though the civil society have been involved in the peace process since a long time. You know. I mean, she talked about uh, more uh, formal involvement in the peace process. And then in this case, what happened is we have this kind of civil society peace forum in which uh, different types of the civil societies, uh, including the very communities and local based civil society have been involved in the uh, peace talks. And then they have had a chance to communicate with those civil society who had uh, international exposures and, you know, relations who have been quite uh, familiar with these international norms, I mean, they meet each other and then learn that, oh, in, I mean, in Myanmar, we have different types of, uh, you know, two different types of civil society. One is more what they call themselves is uh, progressive groups and the other is uh, more like community based groups which only focus more on socio-religious and education development of the poor people. So this group is not that, uh, you know, very familiar with uh, international norms, and then they have this kind of divide, you know. Um, and then the other groups call uh, themselves as the progressive groups, they point out, oh, those uh, you know, community-based, uh, local-based civil society, I mean, why they are even not familiar with the basic hum human rights norms or gender norms, you know, they challenge the other groups. And then they started talking about this kind of uh, uh, liberal ideas, they more like cautious to be like a liberal idea. But one important thing is soon after this progressive group uh, started talking about this uh, liberal ideas, then they have been experienced with this challenge of their values. 
through this uh, Rakhine issues. They have been tested. Many of the civil society fail, you know, uh, and yeah, so this is the situations in Myanmar and what I think is um, um, in Myanmar, I think uh, we are different from, I think, Thailand and uh, Cambodia case. We are still at the stage of learning, you know, uh, democracy, I mean, even representative democracy. So I, what I think is, uh, and then learning about more on the development project as well. And we have so many things still to learn. Yeah, so, uh, and then, at that case, what I found out is the civil society role is very important to forming the norms and shaping the norms, the new norms in the society. So as a norm builders and shapers of the society, what I think is they should at least, I mean, they should embrace at least the, the fair norms for the whole humanities in the society. Thank you. Right, thank you. I want to pick up, uh, both Rick and Miat had mentioned the international dimension, which didn't seem to come up at all in Thailand. Can I ask Nariman and Kevin to reflect on that a little bit? Yes, well, uh, maybe before reflection, I think, I mean, if we're saying that the core pillar of democracy is two concepts, liberty and equality, the big issue for Thai civil society is that when you use the word, I mean, many of them talking about the issue of equality would like to work for the community, so and so. But the big problem, and I think when we talk about the issue of liberty, the big problem for Thai civil society, I mean, especially when they face the new different type of opposition. I mean, during the 1970, 1980, you are clear that your opposition is the military or dictator. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the 20th century or 21st century, you don't know how to deal with the business. You don't know how to deal with the parliamentary system that come with the business and the policy. The big problem is that they compromise the concept of liberty. Feeling that you are what you call acquired uh, enemy is more useful than a new, eco new uh, enemy that you don't know before. And that is a big mistake. <coughs> because rather than try to be more democratization, demonopolization, you go back to the another different term. Feel that, okay, a certain level of monopolization in terms of power will be more useful. And I think this is the first big mistake. Second thing is go too much on what you call issue-based politics. The, big, the real big problem is that it goes from one issue to another issue. And in that case, they might feel that to dealing with the uh, illiberal or dictator or authoritarian to pass a certain law or policy, it will be useful for their project, I mean become project-based or issue-based, rather than seeing it's a whole policy. And at the end, it come back with a backfire. I and mean, <coughs> this is a big problem for, for Thai civil society. And I think in that case, it reflects their legitimacy at the end. Uh, we talked yesterday that civil society is, has legitimacy because you have a people. But when your people <laughs> doesn't want what you want to do, that becomes a problem that you lost your mass base. Mm. They just go to the political party that can answer. And you cannot blame them. You cannot just say because of money, so and so, and this and that. But they have to be so why. But because you come out with a certain issue and you cannot, what do you call? You cannot say that I represent you, so I know more than you, and I can think longer than you, so this is so and so. And this is a big problem for the legitimacy of the Thai civil society, I think, in the past <coughs> 10 years. And also already reflect in the election and already reflect that how happened for the civil society. Another issue is also uh, not only on the issue of legitimacy, the second issue is autonomy. Because you work closely, I think this is, it's not called pattern and client, but the feeling that 
I think if you receive funding, they already have a de debate a long time ago about how autonomy do you have from the project that you receive. And high civil society cannot avoid this problem. <coughs> when you don't have enough funding from abroad, you get the funding from the state. Whether, whether intention or unintention, the issue of autonomy is become a problem that how do you compromise? Maybe my feel that okay to get the existing status quo is better for a certain project, but in that case, the status quo is already affect your autonomy. And I think this is a big problem for the Thai civil society that can you differentiate your relationship with the state? And I think since the junta is very clear, the so-called Prasharat project, I mean, we might know about the word Palang Prasharat Party, but the basic concept of the Prasharat project under the junta government is that they are mixing the one that Kevin said. You have the state that become the leader. You have the business who also support the fund to do the project. And then you get the civil society to be the broker. And then you get a farmer. But the big problem for this kind of type of project, you might say that this is a philanthropy, so everyone happy. But the big question is that where is your autonomy line? And how you can claim your legitimacy? Because you're supposed to represent the people not represent the state project. And I think this is a really big problem for the civil society if they want to regain their legitimacy. Uh, many people might say that it's related to the issue of class, middle class. I think I'm not sure whether it is the issue of class, middle class in terms of when we talk in the previous panel. But I think this is an issue of the problem of the intellectuality. <laughs> I think how, because if we consider civil society people as a public intellectual, I think one issue that they need to reconsider, I mean, if you're going with the class, your class that you need to support is the lower class. But I think they are still have a problem. The <coughs> second issue may link to with uh, Mithet say, I think Thai civil society still national centric approach i mean we might look okay transnational but when it go to my grand worker believe me it go back to the nation state centric approach and this is a thing that we i mean it will be not now but it will be within five years or ten years the issue of transnational the issue of non non citizen state will be another issue that will be challenged for thai civil society Kevin, do you want to pick up on either the issue of class there or the role of Internationalisation yeah. was... Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, um, this is sort of anecdotal, but if you go back to the 1980s in Thailand, um, most of the NGOs were, do, uh, were doing good developmental work and they were all being funded internationally and they had the projects mm -hmm. going. But by the early 1990s, young people won't remember this, but Thailand suddenly became and graduated to become a, a NIC a newly industrialised country, and the aid started to drop off, whether it was from governments or from overseas funding organisations, other you know, international NGOs. And the Thai NGOs were then forced to look elsewhere for their funding, as you said. Business was one area, but business wasn't, uh, hadn't set up a lot of foundations and that sort of thing. There were a few, and some NGO leaders went to those to get funds off those foundations and funnel them out. But one of the big trends, which became institutionalised, particularly when you got to around about the 1997 constitution, was the idea that the state should provide funds for NGOs, through, particularly through the Local Development Institute. Mm -hmm. And the Local Development Institute then became a site of struggle over political ideology. Uh, so when, when the international project was finished, the national project began. And that has been, you didn't say it this way, but it's been toxic for yeah. NGOs. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm wondering if I can ask then, Barack and Miatet reflect a lot on the international. Do we see the same blurring between state and business and civil society, in your opinion, in Cambodia and in Myanmar? Uh, not yet, but we're on the cusp of that. We're mm. actually, Cambodia is actually in that transition. Um, but that's the difference between Cambodia's case and, and Thailand's case. 
we are not going to become a national project. Civil society will not become a national project. We'll become a China project. <laughs> um, and this is this is the problem. I think thinking of as ourselves, I think even the even civil society and Mr. I said, Cambodian people themselves believe that we are a project, that we need the rescue of others people. And if that doesn't come from the West, it, it has to come from somewhere. It can't be coming from ourselves either. So I would rather see a Thai project, I mean a transition to a, a toxic situation <laughs> that still seems somewhat a bit better than, than, than where we are likely uh, heading. And, and this is why, to me, it's intriguing um, where we're, we're heading. We're actually, I, I hate to use this word, the cross at the crossroad, and every, it's always misused and abused all the time, but in some way, Cambodia is at that crossroad. We, we can make uh, certain decisions, but also there's a lot of opportunities um, because Cambodia, as I said, is a unique uh, case, and even the word unique is also abused quite a bit, but it's uh, somewhat unique because of the, the, the cutting, the, the history that is actually got cut at, in 1970, 75, right, 79. So, so because of the Khmer Rouge, that whole history restart completely. And, and it's unique because a generation shift will take place. Uh, the complete generation shift has been taking place over the past this, this decade, uh, and will be complete within the next decade. And that means uh, uh, there's a lot of potential problems, but also a lot of uh, opportunities. The question is actually how you deal with it. Now, I'll be transparent. The Future Forum, my organization, is actually a, a Western project. We are actually getting funding from the Swedish Embassy, Open Society, uh, the, the uh, Australian <laughs> the, uh, direct funding uh, program. We have some from the German. Um, but the way I structure the organization, and this is something I think we should all be a bit more transparent, is, is how do you really can be a bit more autonomous and at the same time taking money? And the, the, my view has always been that you, the stars need to be aligned. That is, that is, we want to do these things because we felt it's important. And if the other people have the same agendas with the money, uh, then, then that will work. Right? And, and this is why the, the interest must be aligned, but also um, we're looking at, 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 kind, uh, at space, for example. We're not really dictating who get to win the next election, right? Or which party should be should be uh, having more chance to win and all of these things. So, so we're trying to, to create a playing field and not really dictating, uh, uh, choosing winners and, and losers. And I think there's actually, there's, because of that, I think this should be reflected with the with donors' communities, with Western international communities, and that the international communities need to, need to focus on creating that space. Let the Cambodian actors themselves fulfill their state and that, 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 that playing field, right? Fulfill it feeling that, that, that feel, uh, creating that, uh, and that, that's really, really the key to the next phase. I think setting the agenda on what a progressive and what's the topic, what's ideas to, to be taking root, I think that's, that day is actually passed about 10, 15 years ago, and, and there's time uh, to, to shift the way, the way international communities deal with uh, Cambodian civil society, and th if there's any hope for liberal democracy in the case of Cambodia, I think, I think it rests with the young people, uh, but also with, with that civil society space. Excellent, thank you. Miata, what's your take on Myanmar? Do we see this blurring of business, state, and civil society, or is it a different playing field? Yeah, actually, uh, we uh, are quite uh, different from um, Thailand. Uh, we uh, really don't have any, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, funding support from the state, you know. Uh, state also do not have any, you know, uh, idea or, you know, thinking uh, to support uh, civil society. Yes, they recently uh, recognized the role of civil society, even though uh, they are related. And, but uh, one another thing important regarding on the state uh, relationships with um, uh, some of the. Um, I don't want to call civil society to them. Some of the groups, like uh, <laughs> and we will. yeah, and you we know will. that yeah, those are uh, <clears throat> those what we call is the the extremist uh, Buddhists and you know uh, the groups. So I, 
what we really um, believe, and we also have some researchers, even though we uh, don't um, disseminate uh, openly, uh, we have some researchers which uh, proves evidences of uh, linking uh, uh, those, uh, and I would say, and civil, uh, civil societies uh, and the government, as, yeah, as, I mean, in the uh, previous uh, government and Utei Singh, as well as uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, not uh, in the led government, but still the military, yeah. And uh, some of the mili pro military uh, government actors in uh, this uh, government. Yeah. So uh, I think um, those uh, state supports as well as uh, support of some of the, the cronies, uh, which is also uh, have a very good relationship with military. Uh, they also have supports from those uh, business people. Yeah, so um, we recently uh, very cautious about those movements, but one thing is uh, we really don't consider those groups as uh, civil societies. We, we only see them as a Mabada as Mabada, mm -hmm. right? Even though the actually some of the international communities and international academicians ask the questions, are they also go, going to be, should be considered as a civil society? Then I, I would definitely say no. We don't see them as a civil society. We are just Mabata as Mabata, right? Yeah, but uh, there's a, surely there's a, some support, yeah. And there are also now, uh, Lately, we also have some of the civil society which is aligned to some of the ethnic M groups and uh, some of the political parties, ethnic political parties. But I would say not, I would say aligned, not allies, because um, based on our recent research on the role of civil society and peace process, those civil society aligned to EAOs or ethnic armed groups or the political parties, uh, even though they um, they are aligned with those political uh, friends, uh, they also criticize them. And it, especially uh, uh, in the peace talks, they what I think is they also consider on the point of view of community interest rather than the, a certain uh, ethnic um, groups or political parties interest. Actually, the reasons why the, some of the civil society align itself is uh, to have some, some voice in the union peace talks. This is one of the reasons they align for some of the civil society. So this is the situations uh, of um, civil society in Myanmar, how they are going to relate with state or political entities. Okay, excellent, thank you. I'm gonna to move to questions in just a minute, but I'm gonna ask everyone to give me a brief one minute max take on where civil society is heading in the next, so let's say 10 years. Uh, Naramon, can I put you on the spot first? Me? <laughs> yeah. Have a one with the map always. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I think we are now is the, in the politics uh, of reactionary. I mean, for the hair there during Kevin time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the civil society <laughs> might be have a so called civil society. At that time, we don't have the word uncivil, civil society. But basically, we have uncivil, civil society. Civil society, oh. not always progressive. I think that's the old hair there with the talking about civil society, media, people, politics. And they try to argue with the big business and extra parliamentary politics. But sorry to say that it's not exist anymore. Basically, we are on the centralized state, and actually, those who are selected to be part of the state project, even though you call yourself civil society, you are not selected, even though you spend so much energy being blamed by our friend, 
and nobody don't talk to you anymore. But basically, in the last uh, eight years, actually, in the last five years, since the 2014, basically, the, the role of civil society, you just be uh, <coughs> only a co-opted co project, a few get selected to be part of the specific social group they're dealing with the state. But basically, the state don't need you. They have their own uh, particular group that they, they, they want to work with. They have their bureaucracy, independent organization that never been independent, and also the state enterprise. So basically, the thing that's happened for civil society here to head forward, for me, first, you just have to be get your real independent, get your real autonomous back from the state. This is, I'm still wonder how, mm -hmm. because it's already, I mean, such a long time under the polarization and under the feeling of fear. I think the big problem is in Thai civil society is a fear factor. Uh, with, in Thailand, people use, used to like the word kwam kluwa tham hai The fear make you the Great, and this is a problem of Thai civil society in the last 10 years, that this is their problem. So to head forward, I think basically you have to see that where is the people. And for them, I think right now they have a certain issue that become the, this illusion. However, if we admit that civil society reflect Thai society, civil society not always mean the progressive part. You have both progressive and conservative. You have both who go for liberal with the liberty concept and those who are not willing to go with the illiberal. And I think the big problem, in fact, for me, it will be politics or contestation inside civil society that we should see that whether the element of those who are more progressive and more with the liberal ideas to be able to win over the old style uh, with the high hierarchy inside civil society to change it. And I think this is the thing that we are fired out for in the five years from now. Excellent. Kevin, yeah. where are you seeing this in five or three Yeah, years? basically what she said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> civil society does reflect the rest of society. So that where, whichever society you're in and whatever stage, level, whatever you want to say, epoch that that society is in, civil society will tend to reflect those forces and struggles and challenges and so on. Internationally though, I think there's, oh, that, that's a different map, but the, 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 <laughs> mov the movement is towards what I call businessification of yeah. civil society. And you see that uh, internationally, you see that in the United States, you see it in Australia, um, the idea that NGOs have to become, or oh, civil society organisations have to become much more business-like in their operations and respond to those sorts of ideas. You know, so if you read The Economist every week, the way to solve Africa's problems is to give everyone a smartphone and they become an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Over, you know. So, but that's the direction I think they're going internationally. Mm -hmm. You use the smartphone to read The Economist every Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if you can afford the subscription. <laughs> Barack, what do you make of Cambodian civil society in the next 10 years? I think, I think civil society in Cambodia will be leaner, mm -hmm. uh, meaner, which is actually, <laughs> I think, more, more capable. Mm -hmm. um, we're at the cusp of actually uh, building that intellectual kind of civil society, um, the knowledge-based kind of knowledge kind of based uh, programming. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's happening now. Um, but it's also more diverse, which means that the Western monopoly on civil society and the narratives in, in Cambodia inside Cambodia and on Cambodia will be, uh, will be challenged. Uh, and that challenge will come from uh, three main sectors, three main areas. One is actually China, and China sponsor uh, a CSO. Mm -hmm. I think just like s Western sponsor CSOs, we will have China sponsor CSO. We will have national civil society, people who's actually gonna work with the state. Uh, and then we will have the business uh, groups also, um, which is make, make it a lot more interesting. I'm, 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 I'm ready for that. I'm actually, I'm actually um, happy for that. And my own, my last, my, my other recommendation is this though. And that is, I think for, for the benefit of, of civil society and, and liberalism for not just Cambodia, but also Myanmar and, and Thailand uh, is bilingualism. I think in some way, just like travel, opening up your world, 
I think language is also opening up your world. And I think there's actually a lot more investment that's needed in, in creating that, uh, opening up that world for, for, for the populations. I think it's in the interest of liberalism and in the interest of all of us to, to also look at that, not just the knowledge, but also the language is actually that allow them to, to open up to more knowledge. So I think with today's technology, I think that's, um, I think that's the, best, uh, the, most, the, the best investment. And yet, where do you see Myanmar civil society in 10 years? Yeah, actually, um, on March 8th, uh, uh, last March 8th, is uh, International Women Day. And I saw uh, on the news in several places in um, um, not a main city, but local cities in Myanmar, uh, women uh, have a march for um, uh, eliminating gender-based violence and uh, more gender equalities, right? And actually, um, this kind of march will not be happen um, unless the gender-based uh, civil society in Myanmar uh, organize or give them the awareness to this uh, very local based, uh, you know, community based women groups, right? So, what I think is um, yes, we are now, um, we have more debates on um, uh, uh, whether the international communities should be uh, involved in um, the Myanmar politics and, you know, peace, support, uh, peace process and support to everything, you know, uh, development in Myanmar, you know, political development, economic development, social development. Uh, what I think is uh, we need those, you know, support to civil societies. And this support means uh, a lot for our country for a very simple things, you know, learning and edu I mean, educating and exposing. Because we've been close for a long time. We need to learn a lot. Yes, with those things, we in some of the cases of the ethical issues, we, I mean, the, the people might be exploited, you know. But the, the thing is, we can also, we have been, these people, poor people have been exploited by, you know, this is a, a monarchic era, you know, and then the colonial era, and then in this, uh, you know, uh, democratic transition eras, I mean, in different eras, you name it, this group of people have been exploited by, you know, political elites, business elites. So what I want to point out is they need to learn a lot. They need to be educated. This is the thing. Then, finally, uh, this foundations of learning and exposure will give us a good foundations to maintain a good rules, practices, and norms. This is the very fundamental base. So I, I really have a hopeful for our civil society, even though they recently been uh, quite tested by uh, issues in Rakhine. One thing I'm quite sure, even if not for all, you know, NGOs and civil society, but majority of civil society, if they learn more about the issues, if they change, if the knowledge they currently have about these issues on the Rohingya, then their actions and response will be quite different. Okay. Yeah, so I have uh, hopes for a civil society uh, to have a play a good role in uh, forming uh, and shaping norms for uh, for the well-being of uh, humanities. Excellent. I love ending our 
internal discussion on an optimistic note, at least. So we've got about a half hour now. Do we have some questions for our panelists? Uh, let's start over here. I might grab two or three and we'll go and we'll go. Uh, Chris from the front. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Bruce here from the Public uh, International Relations here at UAE. So um, my question also ties into I think Chris' uh, question and ties partly to the theme of the relationship between the state uh, during the recent period. So uh, I can speak from my research on women's marketing and migrant worker protection space specifically. So I see a clear division between two groups of uh, NGOs. So on the one hand, we have NGOs who are opposing uh, the military junta, and then on the other hand, we have CSO and NGOs who are well connected with China's national net, uh, advocacy networks, and they have close working relationships with the U.S. counterpart and the EU counterpart, and even funded by the U.S. State Department on issues on human trafficking and migrant protection. But then on the other hand, they prefer the military to work with the military junta and leverage their access to key decision makers and expedite, uh, expedite uh, uh, legislation process and the military junta can just pass laws and regulations like lightning and that's why they prefer the military junta. So my question is, uh, with this kind of nuance and mixed landscape, can we call this civil society organization illiberal or do we need a new label? Excellent. Should I start at the high end of the panel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, maybe uh, uh, for the Thai civil society, I agree with, uh, I, I mean, with Ajahn Chris in some way. Uh, but as I say that Thai civil society work on issue based, <laughs> is we are always issue based. <laughs> uh, we might work on gender. I law, legal reform, human trafficking, protect the Mekong River, Salawin River, and other. And for, for civil society, yes, they have a certain thing that changed. One thing for me is that the old, I mean, if you look at the institution, so called the establishment of the civil society, meaning the Thai NGO court, they call the coordinating committee. They are the, I mean, the structure of the those who are old in power and also have the framework. The issue thing that the the one issue that is related to Thai civil society is that when it come to the transnational issue, I mean, they, this uh, transnational issue meaning uh, cross border migration, human trafficking, gender, peace, environment, which is about the watershed. That seemed to be okay that they work together. We might call them a new thing. The issue, the interesting issue is that for those a new group, do they think that parliamentary politics should be their platform rather than working with the authoritarian in order to pass IUU lifting, I mean, back to the human trafficking. And at the moment, it's still <coughs> debating. 
some group already talking, especially those who work on civil liberty. They go beyond, they feel that the parliamentary platform is the best way because it's made like a people equal and that the issue of liberal is uh, and liberty function. But another issue on trafficking, on IUU fishing, migration, cross migration, they are still feel that to be with the, the existing mechanism is the way that they should work because it's make their project finish. It might be on a good side in a sense that, okay, we want to help the migrant worker, but if we are going to fight against the junta, the migrant worker may not get the new law. But I think nobody haven't asked them yet, <coughs> is it sustainable to work with the junta in order to pass a certain law? And I think nobody have ever challenged them yet that is it sustainable to do in that way, even though your law is passed. And I think this is a thing that happened. Um, again, she takes all the things. Sure, she can take the first person. Um, <laughs> following up on what Chris said, uh, I, did you mention the groups in the in the regions, or you just you you were no? Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the interesting things as well. You know, like you've got a f you ended up with a few student groups linking with local people uh, who became a new opposition to the military, or the military identified them as a new opposition. Uh, it might have been six of one, half a dozen of the other. But those groups are all young people, not necessarily connected to the old, even to the red and yellow, necessarily. Um, so I think that there are reasons for, uh, but, but for, for, for feeling a, 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 that things might be a bit more positive. But at the same time, they remain in a sense, still issue-based. Um, but in the period when the junta was cracking down, particularly in the northeast and the north, on almost everyone, they did have some successes, particularly in getting local people to mobilise and, uh, and oppose things that the junta was trying to push through. So there's some positive there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add? I forget. The, they also have some civil society with the red shirt, and they are still work, for instance, the issue of the anti Pak Mun Dam. They mm. are the one who get arrest nearly every month when they try to protest. And for them, they have long before. And I think a certain, uh, what you call, a certain issue that the junta feel that this is, this, they are too normal, too little people, but they have a certain group, especially when it go to the res, uh, resource politics that the junta feel that big business is better than the civil society and that one is also make them more democratized and radicalize them and make them to link with the red shirt and, 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 and we see a certain movement that takes place. You look at the agenda of this conference and the, um, as an overall agenda of a, of a rule-based region, right? A rule-based regional order, for example. Uh, that, that agenda fit with some of us, some of our agendas. For example, my own, I believe, is actually in, in Cambodia, it's interest to not become, to not remain a project of anybody, right? Um, and and there's the, the best strategy to go about doing that is actually to, to, to also support a rule-based kind of regional order, uh, which means that I think we need to find a way to influence that policy, that at least as strategic decisions. Uh, that would fit with Australia's agenda. In, in, I mean, and, and, and this is where I said the stars need to be need to, need to align for, 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 for international Western organizations and, and donors to, to support. Um, Australia is doing such an amazing job already in influencing somewhat Cambodia foreign policy direction. Um, you look at some of the people who actually study at ANU right now, on those people who actually graduated and went back and, and doing stuff that is actually on, on foreign policy shaping the discussion of the, of the next 10 years. Uh, invest more in that. It fits your agenda, it also fits Cambodia's agenda. Um, it's perfect, the stars align, and then trying to be a, a bit leaner and more meaner, and, and I think that's, that's the way to do it. But second, the, the only danger I see is, is, is two. One is cost, uh, two is brain drain. Many of them go back and many of them didn't go back. 
And it's not, that's not beneficial to Cambodia, that's beneficial to Australia. <laughs> I want to see, to make sure that it benefits, uh, benefits uh, beneficials to both countries and, and the whole region. And in the hope that if it aligns with humanities, then it's perfect, right? If it's beneficial to humanities, then it's perfect. Whether it's on climate change or rule-based regional orders or any of that stuff. So, so invest more in the knowledge, in, in that kind of uh, knowledge, kind of um, uh, civil society. I think that's, that's the, the way to go. But also critical thinking has a double-edged sword, right? Because you're going to see me critical of Western governments and Western uh, people as well, and the Western projects as well. I mean, if I don't see, if the agenda doesn't fit with our own agenda, we'll be critical, and some people are not happy with it. Um, so we, when you teach people critical thinking, expect that, and, and don't get frustrated with it. And the fact that I think when, when we have this diverse, as I expected in the next 10 years, right, this diversification of civil society, the lack of monopoly, uh, Western monopoly of civil society in, in, in Cambodia, don't get frustrated with it. Deal with it. Come on, you know, because, because if, if you look at China's sponsored civil society, it has to be in their own shadow, in their own system, right? Which is actually doesn't, doesn't allow creative critical thinking in some way. So, so they can't be that strong. They can be big. They can be large, but they cannot be that strong, right? So they cannot be that mean. So, so, so I think there's still, I think in terms of the, the values, civil society and, and liberalism, they still match with, with the concept of liberal civil society. So if it match, then meaning that you already have a huge upper hand in, in that next debate. And, and so go with it. Embrace it, have fun. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, Tell us anything you want to respond to? Um, as Conclusion? Uh, uh, no, we can take some more questions yeah. and come back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, hi, my name is Simon from the uh, Department of Social Security Solution. Um, I have two questions. The first is bit of idea. Uh, I've been working in actual information and do we consider these actual information culture organization as mm -hmm. type of civil society? Mm -hmm. And my I'm interested in the issue of entrepreneurs that uh, I would say. Um, I think we have to be realistic that funding comes with certain value and uh, that I come from the West that they want to sort of create a more liberal society, right? So when the funding uh, sort of drops off and then uh, Thai civil society <coughs> or maybe other countries struggling to buy alternative source of funding and then it goes to the state and you know it also comes with certain value as well so that they have to follow that guideline and the NGO have a hard time trying to negotiate that and uh, that's the, the situation today. Um, it was also Thailand you know a few years ago the state uh, gave like 50 million baht to fund civil society, local civil society and that kind of becoming a big problem because there was a lot of debate and among civil society, whether or not they would take that money. And that, does that mean that the state is going to buy off civil society in the area? So that is still a big issue. The problem that is still cannot be resolved in Thailand is that civil society cannot really find a sustainable source of funding to fund their um, projects or, or you know, their work in the long term uh, in order for them to maintain independence. So where that money would come from. We thought that, you know, when Thailand becomes a middle-income country, we have a dream that maybe the middle class would support uh, NGO work, and that will have to, or it's not enough to maintain, um, uh, you know, their, uh, their work. Because, probably because they cannot, you know, those kind of value, the liberal value, cannot really take root in the society. Because people don't spend money, I don't give a nation for NGO, right? They give money to, and, but there's no tradition in the society to give money 
proper plantation and use profit from those, uh, you know, proper plantation to find positive. It's really the real thing. And because it's not really so hard to try to find funding to, to fund a project to giving legal aid to people, and then they don't have, uh, you know, sustained uh, funding to, to, to fund their okay. work. So I'm just um, interested in, you know, what has uh, Kevin said earlier about entrepreneurs, CSO becoming entrepreneurs. Yeah, you can sort of shed more light on that of, you know, what might be a feasible, uh, concrete uh, solution. Thank you. It was uh, one at the back, Mr. Bob. Uh, two. Uh-huh, I'd say. Uh, very back row. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I am Olga Chakma, a PhD student in the Department of International Relations. I learned a lot about the civil society. You have probably heard some, some challenges like polarization mm -hmm. among the civil society. You have the elite culture, you know, the elite person, the business elites, and some other elites control the civil society. And also, uh, you, thought, uh, you talked about soft issues like migration and trafficking issues. Uh, on foods, civil society involves, but uh, the hard issues, hard policies like parliamentary politics, elections, mm -hmm. uh, these issues are beyond the uh, uh, intervention from the civil society because of fear and you know, personal security problems. But my question is, uh, there are many elements within the common platform, which is called civil society. Uh, if we categorize all the elements of the civil society into two groups, we can get the radical elements and the progressive elements. And I wonder if the radical elements come to that common platform, because civil society embraces all of you, and how can we consider that radical elements as a civil society. That's my first uh, question. And the second question is, uh, you know, you have talked about the interest-based groups because civil society people take international support, uh, international aid from different states and international organizations. If it is the case, and how can you identify interest-based groups from civil society? That's the second question. And I have uh, Can we uh, limit ourselves to two for now, please? Yeah. We've got a few yeah. other questions yeah. to get yeah. through. Okay. Uh, there's and somebody who's been waving at me from the very back row for a little while though that I want to take before I get everyone to respond. <laughs> We've got a lot to respond to in about 10 minutes left in the session, so I'm going to ask you to try and be direct. Uh, Miatek, can we start with you? Okay. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when we see ethnic uh, civil society in uh, Myanmar, we can see two different things. One is uh, ethnic literature and cultural uh, society. Uh, so it is formed uh, with, uh, I think, uh, encouragements and you know support of the state. But we cannot consider they are very uh, pro-state, pro-government. Uh, we cannot consider like that. And another group is the uh, ethnic civil societies working on uh, issues like uh, human rights, gender, environment, um, and things like that, yeah, and peace as well lately. Yeah, so um, I, would, uh, I would say, uh, very openly that um, ethnic civil society mostly are more liberal. What I yeah think is, uh, yes, some of the people question their alignment with the ethnic M groups. Yes, they are quite aligned to ethnic M groups. Some of the civil society well, are, I mean, are founded with some of the uh, former leaderships of the ethnic M groups. 
but uh, they lately also are very uh, firmly on the liberal values and they also quite openly criticize uh, the ethnic Ambrose when they uh, breach the uh, you know uh, human rights and you know uh, yeah especially human rights yeah so I would yeah praise for them and yeah and online things uh, if you'd like to yeah of course uh, online politics is also very yeah, intensive uh, lately in Myanmar and government is especially I would say um, yeah uh, re very recently uh, military uh, because of those fights across the country, uh, they are very uh, uh, cautious and very sensitive about the attacks. Yeah, so uh, uh, they are started scrutinizing on the civil society post, and then of course we have a very uh, intensive, you know, uh, uh, war fights, online fights uh, between uh, groups. Yeah. Cambodia has a Facebook Prime Minister. <laughs> he, 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 he's, he's obsessed with it. He ruled through it. Uh, so we're definitely, um, we're definitely embracing online politics. Uh, and then we have an opposition who's actually one is in jail, or one is in house arrest, uh, one is actually in exile. So the one in exile is all, all he, he, he has done pretty, is pretty much uh, he's definitely a, a Facebook uh, opposition leader. Uh, even when the time he was not in exile, he came back, he was still not going <coughs> to the grassroots and meet people or talk to his own leadership. He still would rather travel abroad and go uh, do everything through <laughs> Facebook also. So we're, we're, the, um, we're the new wage, the, um, not democratic um, in, in many ways. They're still stuck in the old ways, in their head, in their thinking, in the, w the way they look at the country. As I said, they, they, is that the vision, the clear divisions of, um, of, um, of that 1979 kind of events where they, you believe in one of the two narratives. So in that sense, 40 years afterward, they're still stuck in that old narratives, but using all of the new mediums mm -hmm. to, 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 uh, to uh, p basically pass on the, se the old narratives. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Um, I'm not very good at online politics, so I can't say very much. All I can say is you're talking about having a Facebook uh, Prime Minister. My eldest granddaughter told me recently that Facebook's only for old people. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how to do a hashtag. Um, I'm, I'm going backwards through the questions. Interest groups and civil society. I mean, most, civil, most definitions of civil society would include what you've called interest groups. The, you know, it's, it's a big sector of society which is only separated from uh, business which can have its own interest groups and the state. Uh, so it, it's, it's an all-encompassing term. So there's lots of different organisations that fit in there. I mean if you think of the United States for example, they're registered, I think in 2015 they had over 350,000 registered tax paying or registered for tax paying purposes. Um, what do they call them? I forget what they call them in the US, but NGOs basically. So it's a huge range. Um, and they, have in, they, they involve interest groups as well. Um, how to make, I think your question was how to make civil society organisations more progressive. Was that sort of what you wanted to know? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, what I've been trying to say is that civil society tends to reflect the politics and the activism, things that are going on in society more <coughs> broadly. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that was talked about in Thailand was that there has been this polarisation of politics and NGOs and civil society organisations for a while tended to reflect that. Okay, there are bits and pieces around the edge that haven't, but that... So, so it's, it's really... Uh, someone, someone in the audience said, uh, I, I think you said it, uh, the problem with Thailand is we haven't had democratisation, so how are civil societies, uh, organisations meant to operate freely <coughs> and independently and all that sort of thing? And I think, you know, that's again a reflection of what's happening in society. I'm not going to really answer your question on how they raise funds now, uh, but let me, another anecdote. The question you asked and the, the issues you raised, they were exactly the issues that people started talking about in the 1990s. 
exactly the same. Where are we going to get it? How are we going to get it? What does, what does that mean when we link to them? In the northeast, you had the split between the progressives and the conservatives, you know, uh, and there were people ousted from NGOs and all these things sort of went on. But one of the responses to that was I remember uh, dealing with and travelling with uh, a group of people who were actively seeking to encourage the development of NGOs and civil society and getting them to look especially at transnational issues but also focusing on the role of business and trying to get business interested in funding civil society. Now here's the kick in the pants. That was uh, Chayanan Samutawanit and Santi Limtongkun and the Limtongkun Foundation. Right? And we all know where they ended up. Right? <laughs> so that project sort of, which was you know, they were talking to all the business associations, all the chambers of commerce throughout, in the regional areas all around Thailand. They had this Greater Mekong project that they were working on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's really, it's got to be organic in some way. It's not something that can just be, and that's what you're talking about, right? An organic project. It can't, it can't be just... You know. Okay, uh, I'm talking back from the social media. I think for the social media and the online platform, we can see future forward is example. I mean, but when civil society is going to use in terms of the online, because it depends how do we treat the social media as a space or as an actor. If we see it as a space, we can see that there are contestation in the online platform. You see right-wing civil society, the drug big collector, use the Facebook to try to arrest or pointing out which hunt. And on the other way, you also see the civil society that progressive and use it online. And it's very fast because it's real time. So it depends whether how we see the social media as a space or as an actor. And as an actor, it's also very interesting <coughs> the thing that the, the Future Forward do. This is a way that they change only as a space to be an actor. However, you have to be fan page in order to follow your actor. Otherwise, it will be still the way. But on the other hand, that one thing that we haven't do analysis is that how sustainable as this platform, because it's happen every day, every minute, and change it. I think this is the thing that we are looking and maybe jump to Rueng Rui. That may be a new platform for funding. I mean, nobody ever talking about how the CSO talking about this kind of funding. What we see the experiment is that now they work with the business, with the cutting dam for the organic farming. You get the sala chana of the cutting dam. So you have, you drink Red Bull, so you know that you support organic farming, whether good or bad <laughs> is another thing. But it's. But if we see the online platform, that may be more possible, that can civil society, but it needs innovation to think how you get funding. And I think this kind of funding need to need more, what you call innovation. For instance, why the temple in Thailand is so success? Because you don't need to pay tax if you pay to the temple. But for the NGO, you cannot do ta tax reduction. Mm -hmm. So can it change a certain system? And we never treat temple as civil society. I mm -hmm. think we need to re-examine because basically, uncivil civil society basically come from temple. I think mm -hmm. nobody mm -hmm. ever asked the Buddhism, the mm -hmm. Buddhism cosmology that how yeah. we create the Theravana. That kind of thing, because I think moral politics, I think we have to go back to the temple. And that's the big problem, that we never look at this, and that might be a new uh, terrain for we to re-examine. If we, look at, we, we would like to look at the illiberal in terms of the civil society. For the interest group and the issue, I think for civil society, uh, many people try to claim that, yes, we are interest group, but our agenda is a public interest group. So basically they accept that they are interest group, but it's a public interest. But I think the big problem for me up until now is not only Thailand. I feel the same with 
I work with Myanmar civil society as well with the ethnic and also Cambodia. We haven't asked about the internal democratization inside mm -hmm. civil society, mm -hmm. and that might be an issue if we're talking about liberal or illiberal. And that might be one thing that it needs to be further looking into the issue, and that may be a new issue. I don't have an answer for this yet, but I think this is a new issue that for us, if we would like to examine the civil society, this issue will be a new challenge that we need mm. to find out our internal democracy among our civil society. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time for our panel, but can you all join me in thanking our lovely panelists?